rehab hospital. Uh, I did my fellowship there. But a lot of people don't know what a neuropsychologist is until they have to come across one for whatever reason. Um, but what it is is a psychologist that specializes in um, relationship and understanding that relationship between brain behavior and function and what happens when something happens to the brain, how does that impact behavior, cognitive skills, functioning. Um, and I'm a little more specialized in that I do mostly rehabilitative neuropsychology. So at the hospital, I work primarily in our inpatient rehabilitation unit. So when kids have some degree of neurological injury and they need some intensive rehab before going home, I work with them there during their acute recovery. Um, so I specialize mostly in acquired brain injury, whether that's traumatic brain injury, stroke, infectious disease, uh, post-tumor resection, um, in the rehab domain, but then I also provide services to our kids who come through the hospital with more mild traumatic injuries, so kids that have concussions, um, and doing brief assessments of their cognitive skills and helping with return to school, uh, return to play through our trauma clinic. I also have uh, outpatient clinic where I'll see patients for long-term follow-up, so I really enjoy that um, because I get to see the kids from the acute stay, and I'll see, is it okay to say Eric's okay. name? Eric you know, a year later. So I like to follow them in the long term because we know that recovery from brain injury is a long marathon, right? Um, and then I'm also on the faculty at UT's Department of Psychology, so I'm involved a lot with the training of our doctoral level students at UT who have hopes of becoming a neuropsychologist. Okay, so the slides that I have, like I said, um, are focused more on special education services. I'll cover just briefly about the impact on brain injury, on thinking and learning, behavioral emotional functioning, motor functioning, but then most of, the, most of the other slides are talking about the difference between 504 and IEP, what does IEP look like, what's the timeline in order to get special education services, um, and kind of breaking down the major components of the IEP. Is that something that people feel like they've already gone through and they understand? and we just want to have a conversation? Or is that something people would like me to go through explicitly talking about the different laws and regulations related to that? Okay. Yeah. You yeah. Go yeah. through them? Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 I just want to make sure. I didn't want to tell you information that you already knew and for you guys not to get anything out of it. Um, is it mostly parents in the room? I'm a said graduate student. Okay. So, and you can help me. Um, I work for Travis County helping families find services. Okay, awesome. Um, we're one of the services that some families find. We're um, the Texas Hill Country School. It's oh, a okay. it's an RTC and non public day school. Awesome. Kids with traumatic brain injury. Oh, awesome. So yeah, sure. my daughter is just starting with public school. Okay. Um, this is her second year of pre K. Okay. Um, and she's just switched to a school that it's their first year of having a PPCD. Okay. Um, so a lot of the people in the this ARD meeting, it was their first time ever having an ARD meeting, and I. I've had an advocate come with me for um, a couple of them at her other school that did not go well, and so it's, it'd always be good to know, um, so I don't have to bring an advocate with me every time, like, 
what my rights yeah. are and what is available. Other big questions people are hoping to have answered? Yeah. Um, kids who are having trouble in high school, mm -hmm. like alternate programs, a okay. homebound, or? Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And my daughter had had a stroke too, so okay. um, she wasn't born with a brain injury, but it was required to be on, and she has never had a neuropsych eval, yeah, but we'll that's scheduled. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Parents in the back too. Well, I'm not actually a speech language pathologist. Okay. Yeah. I work with you guys a lot. All right. Um, all right. Let me see. I'll just look here. Is it okay if I sit as well? I hate standing. <laughs> so we're talking about acquired brain injuries, and the biggest thing to keep in mind is that no two brain injuries are alike. The way people sustain brain injuries, the type of brain injury they are, they're all different, and everybody recovers at a different rate in a different way, all based on a lot of different things that I'm not going to get into in this talk. But to speak broadly about acquired brain injuries, when we're thinking about the impact on cognitive functioning, so thinking about thinking and learning and those things that you really need to be a successful student, the areas that we see the most difficulty in are memory and new learning. So kids don't usually, once they acquire injury, lose information that they learned before the injury. What they had trouble with is learning new information and retaining that new information. Um, we see a lot of problems with attention, so staying focused in the classroom, um, not getting hyper-focused on one thing and not being able to focus on another thing, being able to switch our attention back and forth. That's something that kids with brain injuries have a lot of trouble with. Um, we talk a lot about executive functioning in kids with brain injuries, and these are all the higher level skills that we as adults have that kids are still developing. And kids with brain injuries have even harder time developing those because of their injury. So these are things like not acting impulsively, being able to plan ahead, to stay organized, to think abstractly, to think flexibly, um, to have insight into their weaknesses. And then another area we see very commonly in brain injury is processing speed. Some of that is if there's fine motor impairments that are getting in the way of being able to do, uh, to do tasks quickly, but also just how quickly they can take in information and think. And you, you think about how those things would really interfere with someone's ability to sit in a classroom and to be a successful student. So some examples that I thought of are, you know, retaining information day to day. You learn information one day at school, you have to be able to retain it the next day in order to build upon it. Um, some kids with brain injuries have trouble retrieving information. They'll learn the information, it'll get in, but when they sit down to take the test, they can't find that information in the brain in order to pull it back out and to test successfully. Staying focused during class, those are boring, right? And if you have trouble paying attention during boring classes, that's gonna be hard. Um, following multi-step directions, managing their frustration, especially right when kids start going back to school after an injury, when things are harder and they, they don't quite feel themselves. Um, and because of the brain injury itself, they might have trouble managing that frustration. Following the rules in the classroom, getting back at more of that disinhibition and impulsive behavior, keeping their materials organized, reading comprehension is a highly cognitively demanding task that our kids have trouble with. If they don't have great insight, they might not know when to seek out help. They might say, you know what, I'm doing okay, I don't need these accommodations, I don't need help, I'm fine. And we as adults and parents know maybe that's not quite the case. Um, and the biggest thing is just keep, that we see a lot is complaining about not being able to keep up with the pace of the class. Um, and what's hard about kids with injuries is a lot of times they're healthy, typically developing kids before they sustain that injury, and they're used to maintaining a certain level of um, success at school. So when they go back to school and they have these new weaknesses, it feels really hard to them and it's an adjustment period. Um, we talked about some of these already. We see a lot of that impulsive, disinhibited behavior after brain injuries, especially traumatic brain injuries. Um, depending on where the injury is and how severe it is, we might have aggressive behavior. So kids that, we see this more often in younger kids, swinging, hitting, and where it becomes more of a safety concern or, or hurting themselves the judgment and safety awareness, they don't have insight, they might be trying to get up out of their wheelchair when they shouldn't be. Um, and the flip side of that is sometimes we see low initiation in kids where they don't know how to get going. They're just sitting there and they need that extra cueing from the teacher or um, more structure to what they're doing in order to get started and to get going. Emotionally, we see a lot of mood swings, irritability, agitation. Kids might seem more socially immature, more silly than they did before their injury. And I already talked about this, but that just adjustment to those new weaknesses that they might experience once they get back to school. And that's another thing is, 
as they're recovering, they might be at home and they don't realize that they have these weaknesses. I'm sure you parents can identify with this. Then they go back to school and those more subtle cognitive changes that they're experiencing, they don't really notice until they get back to school. And then that's when they start to really start to feel depressed or anxious because they don't feel like the same kid that they were before. And as kids, I always say a kid's main job is to be a student, right? That's, that's their job. They're, they're, they have to go to school. And when you, know, you think about your identity as a student, having changes to it, that's a lot to deal with as kids get ready to go back to school. And then with brain injury, we also have the motor components as well. So not just the thinking and the learning skills or the emotion and behavior, but there's also logistics about how is a child going to interact and get around at school. So with brain injuries, we might see some degree, if there's a spinal cord injury, it might be complete paralysis in the child's in a wheelchair. Or they might just have weakness on one side, the paresis. The, uh, we see balance difficulties all the time, and imagine having to navigate really crowded high school hallways if you're not so steady on your feet. Um, also, if kids are in car accidents, they might have other injuries that aren't related to the brain that needs to be dealt with. I've had a kid who have had you know, um, a urethral injury, so he has catheters, and how's that gonna get managed at school? Um, but also fine motor, fine motor problems as well. Again, um, dexterity, coordination, not being able to keep up quickly with your hands. Um, so if you need to be taking notes, typing, all that stuff at school, that's gonna get in the way. Um, any questions about that stuff before we move? That was a very quick overview of the impact of brain injury on um, cognitive and behavioral functioning. Any questions about any of that or any experiences people want to share before I move on into more of the special education law portion? All right. All right. So there are two main laws that um, as parents or educators or therapists that you need to know about as far as special education. One is the section, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the other one is IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disability Education Act of 2004. And if you ever really wanted to read these in depth, you can just Google them and, and find them online to read. But as a broad overview, Section 504 is a civil rights law. So that law was enacted back in the 70s as more of an anti-discrimination law. So under the civil rights law, it prohibits discrimination of these students because they have a disability. Um, so schools need to meet the needs of the students with disabilities in the same way that they, they meet the needs of all other students. And this needs to be across all aspects of school, not just in the classroom, but extracurricular activities, if they're in any clubs or athletics, a child cannot be discriminated against because of their disability. They need to be able to access all of those things. The school needs to give them accommodations if they need to in order to access it so that they can access it just like their typically developing peers. Um, and as part of this law, disability has more of a broad definition that we'll talk about, but all you have to show is that a child has a disability and that it interferes with a major life activity, whether that's their self-care, whether it's walking, if, you know, if a child's in a wheelchair, that's clearly um, a major life activity that's being interfered with, but also learning, so anything that impacts their learning, and that's where really the school piece comes in. Um, and then the IDEA is a special education law, and this is what we'll be talking a little bit more about today. And so it's really, how do kids with disabilities get access to special education? And it's the law that governs all of that, and this is at the federal level. Um, so by law, all children are entitled to a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, and we'll talk about what those things mean. And again, like I said, this is, special, this is emphasizing special education. 504 is more not discriminating against a child because of a disability. This is what is this, if a child needs special education, special intervention, these are the laws that govern it. Um, with the overall goal being to help prepare them to be successful in school, but also successful outside of school. So first, 504. Anyone here with kids with on 504 plans? Obviously, I don't have a kid, but I'm in a You have a 504 plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the 504 plan, we, we usually talk about two plans. One is the 504 plan that's governed by that 504 law. The other is the IEP that we'll talk about, and that's governed by the IDEA law. So with the 504, it's an agreement with the school about what accommodations they're going to provide the child. Um, and that's all it is. It's modifications and accommodations. No special education. Um, kids that need specially designed instructions, that is above this, that's the IEP. This is just accommodations and modifications. And as I mentioned before, their definition of what a disability is, is quite broad in comparison to what we will talk about um, with IEP. So these might be kids who have ADHD, who just need some extra 
supports at school. So if they needed um, extra time or a quiet room, that kind of stuff. They don't need specially designed instruction for them. They don't need a special individualized plan. They just need some supports to help accommodate for their disability. Um, we also see 504 plans used for uh, medical conditions that really don't interfere with cognitive functioning. So if a kid has um, a spinal cord injury, like I said, and needs their catheters taken care of, that would be a 504 accommodation or modification. Um, and the difference between a modification and an accommodation is the modification is actually changing what a student is being taught um, or is expected to learn. It's changing that. The level of instruction might be changed. A different standard is created for them. And you contrast that with an accommodation, which are some of the things I was talking about. That's really just changing how a student learns. It doesn't change what they're taught or what they're expected to learn. But if they need to learn things in a different way by, you know, if they need a copy of notes, that kind of thing. That's just changing how they're getting the information. It's not changing what they're expected to learn and, um, or what the teacher is teaching them. So these are just some examples to show you kind of the differences between the two. Modifications, changing what? Changing the added expectation. So they might have fewer homework problems than their peers. They might have different test questions designed for them. Uh, they might have to write a shorter paper. They don't have the same length requirement. The teachers might use a different grading system for that student than the other student, um, and the instruction might include different materials than their peers. Yes? So this is basically what you could also call it a term of assessment, so they can decide to judge their grade on in a right. different format. Right, or if someone says, you know, the attempt, do they do the work versus getting 100%, or if you're talking about handwriting, Let's not judge them on the clarity of the handwriting, just that they attempted to write. So you're not, they're not getting dinged for the disability that's causing them. How do you get that for a kid? For a 504 plan? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have it in there. You just re oh, I spent so much time on 504. You just request it. So it's not as long as a process of IEP, because we're going to go through the IEP process. The 504, you just have to show that the child has disabilities. You just go to your, you request, I would request it in writing, say, I think my child might need some accommodations based on X, Y, and Z. Do you mind if I share yeah, that? Yeah, please go. So, um, disability, Texas Dis Disability Rights of Texas, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Google that. Their website has an education tab, and it's really helpful. It has the IDA written out, as well as the 504 yeah. laws. It has an awesome manual about yes. all of it. And yeah. it has, like, form letters for parents. To, it has, like, the specific language for those requests for the yeah. 504 or for the special ed evaluation. It's just really helpful, lots of resources. But the school doesn't have to do a full-blown evaluation process. Right. Not to the process right now. So, um, but they do sometimes need documentation from a medical okay. provider to show that there is a medical disability. And will they take this up the level to like community college, or um, or does it stop after? It's stop. so this is just through pub. So these are laws that are um, that governs our, the public school system. So they don't do accommodations. But to college. every college has a disabilities office. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the college at that level to decide how they're going to implement it, but every college does have a disability office. And you don't always need um, medical, medical documentation in college. Sometimes the student can even go and just say, I have trouble focusing, I just let you test separately without even proving that. Colleges so are yeah, those private institutions aren't as governed by the... Um, and there's just some more examples of accommodations that kids may need. I, I had a question about, yeah. you said changing catheters and stuff, so mm -hmm. my daughter may be having a really big surgery mm -hmm. in the next several months, and I thought I would just have to keep her home mm -hmm. until she's better. No. So, schools have nurses, and nurses should be trained. So, for kids that need medical assistance or help with self-care, they'll have a um, self-care plan that the nurse will follow. Some kids take medications at school, some kids get capped at school, um, so probably the two biggest ones. Or if there's like a wound thing that needs to be changed, school nurses can do that. And the school has to yep. provide it, whatever it mm -hmm. is needed to uh, for your daughter to be able to participate in education, even if it's a homebound. Right. So we'll talk about homebound in a bit. Um, so IDEA, again, the other law that is talking about special education. It's above. It's kind of like the 504 and steroids. It's the intense 
if your child needs special education in order for them to access their curriculum, what is this school going to do to make sure that they succeed? Um, and by, so this is a federal law. Again, it's at the level of the federal. The state implements it, each state implements it a different way, but this is what the federal law mandates, is that every child with a disability, and here disabilities can be defined a little bit differently, but between the ages of three and 21, um, the schools are required to provide them the appropriate education. Um, and our local public schools gets, get funding from the government as long as they do it correctly, right? So, um, and these are the main components of IDA, is that every kid is entitled to free, meaning not cost to the parent, and appropriate, meaning it meets the child's need, public education. Um, if there is a disability suspected, whether it's by you as a parent or a medical provider or a teacher, then, and it's thought to have a substantial impact on that child's functioning at school, then they're entitled to be evaluated across all the different areas of functioning that we think it might be impacting, the school has to provide that evaluation, and we'll talk about that. Um, so that the IEP, that's where the IEP comes in, we'll talk about the IEP, that's part of this IDEA, um, and that's created to identify what the student's goals are for each academic year and how the school is gonna meet those goals or help the child achieve those goals. Um, another main part of IDA is that kids are instructed in the least restrictive environment. So we try as much as possible to keep kids in that general education classroom and provide them as much support to keep them there and then work from there down to a level of self-contained classroom or homebound. Um, parents are a huge part of the education process. You're the person on their IEP team too. Um, and that through this law that parent has the right to challenge anything that the school does. You don't sign anything you don't want to sign, you don't accept anything you don't want to accept, and if you don't believe in it, that what they're doing is right, then you're entitled to due process. And we won't get into that today because that's a whole legal mess, um, but there are resources on that. All right, so IDEA. These are for the kids, like I said, 3 to 21 with a disability. And at the federal level, there are 13 disabilities in which a child can qualify for an IEP. And those are listed there on the right. I have other health impairment and traumatic brain injury, because with this population that we're talking about, those are usually the categories in which they can qualify for um, an IEP. And these are the two categories that also require, um, one of many, that require medical um, documentation to show that they have one of these conditions. Um, so not only do you have to have the condition, but you have to show, the school has to show, that that disabling condition has a negative and substantial impact on the child's ability to access their curriculum. So that's the difference between a 504 and an IEP, is that you have the disability and it's getting away to the extent that you need specialized intervention in order to succeed in school. Um, all right, so what is an IEP? Have people seen IEPs? Have people understood the IEP, <laughs> right? They're crazy. And, I used to live in Maryland, and in Maryland, this, every IEP, no matter what school district you're in, they were all the same. It was amazing. But here, every school district does an IEP a different way, and it just <laughs> mind boggling. But, um, but the IEP is that written document. It's the formal agreement between parents, the student, and the school with what the school is going to provide to the child in order to meet their goals. It contains those goals, and we'll talk about the goals, um, and it, goals for each area of need that the child has. It talks about which special education services that the school is going to provide, if there's any related services that the school is going to apply. That's clearly outlined in the IEP. And also it provides information about who's going to be providing those services, to what extent, and across what period of time are those services um, are going to be provided. So how do you get an IEP? That is a lot more intense than the 504 plan. So like you said, 504, I'm like, I don't know, you just go to the school and ask for it. But the IEP there is a very long process in order to get an IEP, and it starts with that referral. Um, and the referral can come from you as a parent, it can come from a school person, it can come from another person involved in the child's care, but as soon as the school receives a referral from somebody, they need to notify the parents and have them sign a consent to start the whole evaluation process. Um, like, I'm sorry, your name? Susie. Susie mentioned there are examples online of written letters that you can use to request special education. So through Disability Rights Texas, they have an awesome uh, packet uh, manual to, about IDEA, and there are letters in there. But we always recommend parents to request it in writing because you have it documented. Keep a copy for yourself. Give one to the front desk. 
and then by law, the school is mandated to have parents sign consent within 15 school days, and that's consent to begin the evaluation process to determine eligibility. 15 they, school days. What if they don't do that? They have to do that. What if it's over summer? So that then the timeline changes. So if it's over summer, you can only do it when school's in session, right? And if you do it within... Um, so if I call after the last day of school in May, Correct. And they don't get back the timeline until starts in the fall, August or September. That's okay. Yes, unfortunately. So no, that's, that's why okay. you think about school days. Mm -hmm. How long this can get drawn out? So the you forty-five for it to start is just so it's a full semester almost. Yep. Like it's yeah. a massive amount yep. of time without services, yep. and most schools take that full yep. amount of time. They sure do. So yeah, it's fifteen days for them to give you just a paper saying, okay, I agree for you to evaluate my child, or let's start the evaluation process. Or three months. Of if you do it right after the <laughs> right. school. Right, exactly. kids really struggling, what do they do? I mean, a lot of times they just can't. They say we them. provide them response to intervention in the meantime, or they'll put them on a 504 temporarily until. Um, so that's why it's really important to know this, because you need to advocate for your child. Yeah. And if your campus is not responsive, call the district. Because oh, yeah. a lot district of level. campus folks, even special ed teachers, are aware of everything. Yeah. So, um, but call your district if you don't feel like your campus is restri um, responsive. And in my experience, experience, if it's something that's ongoing on school, like my son's in speech therapy, speech therapy is ongoing at school. So in those 45 days, they asked if we if they could start treating him. Like just, you know, without everything fully done. And I said, yeah, go ahead. Like, you know, the sooner the And more. every school interprets the laws and regulations differently. Some schools are much easier to work with. Other school districts are terrible to work with. And it's... Knowing your rights, advocating for your child, and just hoping for the best. And if you feel like you're not able to do it, there's advocates available through this. I have some resources at the end of this. Um, yeah, so 15 days for you to sign saying they can evaluate. Then they have 45 school days to complete their evaluation. I mean, we're going to talk about what that evaluation is. Again, 45 school days, that's two, three months, right, for them to evaluate the need for special education. Um, and they call that when you do it the first time an FID. You might hear it called that the full and full and individual initial evaluation. Again, no cost to the parents. It's done by people employed by the school district. They're completing a very comprehensive evaluation. Uh, it's not just one test. It shouldn't be just one test <laughs> if a school is evaluating. Sometimes it may be, but they're tr they must cover all areas of suspected disability. So that means their cognitive functioning. Is their academic functioning? If they think it interferes with their physical or speech functioning, they need to do a PT evaluation and speech evaluation. If there's a behavior component to it, they need to do a full-blown behavior evaluation, which you've probably heard about in the last talk. Um, they need to gather all that information. That's why they have this extended period of time to do it. It's because it's a lot of information gathering, testing your child, um, interviewing you, getting information from you as a family. Um, and I already said, right, so they're evaluating the educational needs by looking at their academic achievement. And then they're also evaluating if they need any other related services, like PTO to speech, if they need any transportation. So if a child's in a wheelchair, what special transportation do they need to provide? If there's nursing services, if they need counseling services, they're evaluating all of these things in that initial evaluation. As a parent, you're entitled to seek out an outside evaluation. Um, and that's where people like me come into play. So. You're allowed to seek out an independent evaluation from somebody in the community who's not employed by the school, but that would be at your expense. And we'll talk about how to kind of get around the expense part. Um, or you can request that the school provide an independent evaluation at the school's expense. That is a lot harder to get because you have to prove that the evaluation that they did wasn't appropriate. And they're going to say, oh, it is, blah, 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 blah. So that's way harder to get. What kind of issues do you see that the school by the, the ones that are done through the school? People within the yep. school. I will talk about that. So, and this is my biased opinion. Sure. I don't work for the school. This is my, as a provider of child, children with brain injury, is um, they are only going to assess what the educational impact is of whatever disabling condition your child has. So they're really going to look at their IQ score, which, um, Shana, is saying right? Shana. Yeah. Shana, yeah. sorry. And I've talked a lot of what is IQ? It's just a, um, I won't start that conversation, but it's it's not a well representative thing. So they look at IQ, they'll look at their academic scores, and then they'll assess for PTOT and speech, but only as it relates to their educational needs. An outside evaluation is going to look at everything, and the school 
We all think that brain injuries are common because we interact with them a lot, but they're not common. And people don't know how the brain in a developing child is impacted. And they don't have that insight, but they're just looking at scores and do those scores meet criteria for a disability or for services. And to contrast that with someone in outside the school um, who really understands the development of the brain, who understands the impact of that brain injury, they're going to look at all aspects of cognition, behavior, emotion that can impact a kid's ability to do well at school. And it's more than just a kid's IQ score and some academic skills. And what do those scores really mean? And what do those scores really mean in the context of where they are in their recovery? Because it changes over time. Um, so when I see a kid, I'm not just looking at IQ, IQ scores and academic skills. I'm looking at their language skills, their attention. The things that we know are really impacted by brain injury. Attention, executive functioning, learning and memory. Those are things that schools don't assess. Should we, are we comfortable enough with these people that are assessing are appropriate to assess? They're appropriate to assess in the context of the school. Just, okay. Right, yeah. And that's the thing is, they're usually psychologists. They're right? school, they're just school psychologists, school. yeah. Um, which is great for kids who have learning disabilities and things like that, but my, again, biased opinion is I think that kids with brain injuries and neurological involvement or even congenital you know, disabilities that persist, there's a whole other level there that I think of understanding that without kind of the knowledge of the brain part that it's hard. Um, and so, I just wanted to add one thing yeah. to that. So um, we had an OT who, my daughter was paralyzed on one side and she couldn't open a marker or anything. Mm -hmm. And they, in their um, FIE, they said she doesn't need her left hand to learn. Exactly. Oh. And told me that that was educationally modeled. So it's the same thing with those evaluations. But that wow. line of them saying that was able to get me an IE where the school paid for it. Yeah. Because so PTOT and speech, if it's not going to impact their education. Not let her have OT in school. I can't answer that. Um, <clears throat> like, so for independent evaluations, because with my youngest son, we had um, evaluations done for spectrum and then yep. also for speech mm -hmm. and all of that, mm -hmm. and took it to the school, yep. and they look at that yep. and they say, he doesn't qualify. Right. So, I don't know if it's in here, but... So the schools, they must consider that information, mm -hmm. but it's up to them to use that information however they want to inform that decision. So I have some schools that just look at a child's FIE yesterday, which was literally my report copied and pasted into their different sections. And I was like, okay, well, I provided a service and the school didn't have to do anything. But then I see other schools that it doesn't even mention that I saw the kid. And some schools really like having my report because when they don't have to do the testing, it saves them a lot of time and money, and it gives them more information that they were gonna, than, the, than the, what they were gonna get. and provides them some information about the brain injury itself. Um, I don't know why I started saying that, but. I, I do think it's helpful, in our case, we spoke directly with each teacher, and mm -hmm. we're like, this is, these are some um, opportunities to engage with them, these are some, these are the things you're looking for, which you don't normally see, and it will present like this, but it really means this, mm -hmm. and here's some ways you can help him grow and learn if right. you do these types of things. Yeah. That was helpful. Yeah. Um, Seven minutes left. Okay. Is that okay? Um, but there, so again, the outside evaluation is at the cost of you. And there's, when you're looking for an outside evaluation, there's two different evaluations really. There's a psychoeducational evaluation, which you might go through like a psychologist in private practice, but they're going to kind of do similar to what the school's going to do IQ and achievement, and they might do a little bit more. Um, and that's not going to be covered by insurance, usually. A lot of people in private practice don't take insurance, and a school's not going to cover a psychoeducational evaluation because insurance is going to say the school can do that. But for a child with an actual medical condition, a neurological condition, a lot of insurance companies will say, show me there's a medical need for this evaluation, and we'll cover it. So for like Eric's case, I saw Eric this summer, and it was covered by insurance because he has a neurological condition in which he needed neuropsychological services. So if you have a child with, even if it's a congenital thing, or stroke, all those things frequently are covered by medical insurance. And as long as you go see a provider who bills medical insurance and not mental health insurance, it'll be covered. And in my opinion, you're getting more thorough evaluation from the schools. Is that fair? All right, so once you get the evaluation, the evaluation, that's when the ARG meeting starts. And they have 30 calendar days. Now we're switching to calendar days. Yes. 
in order to hold that first meeting. Okay? Um, and then it's in the, in the context of that meeting where everyone who's involved with the evaluations are there, you're reviewing the evaluation results, they tell you what their decisions are, how much um, PT, OT, speech they're going to get, what setting they're going to be in, what accommodations they're going to be in. Um, and then only if you agree with that do you sign saying, I'm consenting to special education services, the IEP is designed, and then you sign that IEP saying, this is our formal agreement and I agree with everything that's in here. Um, our meetings are held every year. So once you go through that whole initial long drawn out process, then every year you meet as a team, parents and students being part of that team, to determine if anything needs to be updated. And then every three years, a child's entitled to a re-evaluation through the school. But when that three years comes up, the school team and the parents decide, do we need to collect more information or does the information that we have is enough? So I would say a lot of times the school don't need, doesn't even fully reevaluate the kid in three years unless there's really a need, an obvious educational need, but a child is entitled to another re, a full blown reevaluation every three years. And a parent can request an art meeting at any yep. time. It, it doesn't have to just be once a year. Yep. You can have one once a month if you want. Yep. If there's anything that you think needs to be changed yeah, or updated, okay. and I always request that in writing because they have to respond to you with things. Can I stick up the month? Just have 504, you're not going to have an art meeting. Correct. Art is that special education. All right, it's 1230. Um, so, this is just one point I want to make. And again, this is something that schools wouldn't really consider in the context of evaluation. So, imagine we're talking about kids who acquire injuries. You have a typically developing child, you expect some level, or you, you expect a certain trajectory for development over time, right? So if we have a child who's developing normally, something happens like a TBI, their trajectory then changes, right? And a lot of times it's a, it takes a different rate compared to their other kids. And what we see is that immediately their function drops right after the injury. They make a lot of improvements those first few months, that first year. And then over time, so in fourth grade, you might see that much of a difference between them and their peers, right? And this is what really separates kids from adults, is that their brains are still developing. But now their brains are developing with kind of a mask of a brain injury on top of it, so how they're developing is different. So you might not see impairments related to the injuries until those skills are expected to come online, so it's those executive skills that don't come online until later in adolescence. So that difference between what you're seeing between them and their peers grows over time in, in certain areas. So then in high school, you might see an even bigger gap in the difference. And that's why this reevaluation is really important. And different than kids, you know, if you have a child who's had, you know, um, like an intellectual disability down syndrome, and they were born like that, and it's pretty stable, and you don't expect that to change over time, like in the genetic conditions, then yeah, you might not need a reevaluation every three years, because you know what you're working with, and their trajectory is the same as it was five years ago. But it's different for kids and brain injuries, because the brain is healing over time, and their difficulties might show their head at a later time. So that's why the reevaluation is, is different in this population. Um, that's the timeline. So again, 15 school days to request it, 45 school days to do the evaluation, and then 30 calendar days to have the art meeting, and then from there, the IEP, and things get implemented. So it can often take a semester, if not a whole school year. Um, it's 12.30, so. Keep going or questions? For the reevaluation. Yes. Um, I was recently told that they don't like to do reevaluations because the children can learn the test. No. And I You can repeat those tests once a year. Mm -hmm. That's how they're designed. So every three years is perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. So they may not like to do the reevaluation, but by law. Cool. Um, these are just some, I'll just go through this quickly. These are just some aspects that I pulled from actual IEPs for us to look at. We already talked about the disability of to meet one of those 13 disabilities. That's part of the initial evaluation is which disability are they qualifying for. Um, they have to show presently where they are with their academic functioning. Star testing is the way Texas schools really like to show where kids are. Um, the annual goals are really the crux of the IEP is what do we expect this child to do in the next year and how are we going to make sure that it happens? So this is a child with a developmental delay who's in kindergarten and what they're working on is really 
if he's given a verbal prompt, we want him to follow two and, th two and three step directions, two out of five trials. So it's a very specific goal, it's a very measurable goal, and it's a very obtainable goal for this child. Um, and then what they do is they make annual goals in all the areas in which their disability is impacting their functioning. So there might be language goals, and if they're getting related services like PT, OT, speech, they all have to have their own goals. Um, there might be math goals, there might be behavior goals, there might be emotional goals. When they get to 14 and above, then they talk about placement goals. Um, let me get here, because this one is actually probably important placement, because you asked about homebound instruction. Um, so homebound instruction is only for, first of all, it's not determined by the school, it's determined by the medical provider. And it is for children who, they use terrible language, like incapable of, or have a, can, I forget what they use, but basically cannot be in school for at least four weeks, for, for at least four hours a day. Um, and that's the only time when they will give you homebound instruction. If for some reason medically, or you've got some contagious disease, that's going to prevent you from physically being in school for at least four weeks, is when the school will start doing the homebound instruction part. Like you have to miss school for four weeks before mm -hmm. they start doing it? You can't nope. you have to anticipate school? that they will miss school for four weeks from the date that you're signing the homebound instruction. So, so we, if you know they're going to have a surgery, you have to plan it. Absolutely. If, you, if your doctor feels like they cannot go back to school within four weeks, yeah. So we struggle with that when we're discharging kids from the hospital because we're like, well, they might be home for two weeks, but we don't want them out for four weeks. So then sometimes we'll do a gradual return where they'll do half days and then increase to full days. Um, but yeah, that's homebound four weeks that they cannot physically be at school. And in that case, they'll send someone out to your house four hours a week. That might be an hour a day, it might be two hours, two days. And it's really only just covering those main subjects. English, math, science, and social studies. Four hours a week, not four hours a day. Oh, no, four hours a week. Just kind of give you the tools. Here's your homework. Bye. Yes. Yep. They, they do try to report if you want. Yeah. And, and there's different quality homebound teachers. You might yes. have a really great one. You might have a teacher you know. You may not. So I noticed that in the class we were experiencing things that doing in the school year in our district, uh, which is kind of said that they don't do homebound over the summer. Nope, they don't do it over the summer. So That's the other thing is extended Austin school year. has like a central homebound that will often do it over the summer, apparently. And so like if you are currently in Dell, you are considered AISD. But they'll only enroll you in Dell if yes. they think you'll be in the hospital for at least five weeks. Right. Right. So there's little things like that. But Dell now has the liaison. Yep. That, 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 yeah, but there are about two years where they help you with dealing with your school and setting all this up. So even if it's still the school year as part of your accommodations, they still don't have to provide the homebound over? So a lot of schools will say we don't provide special education services over the summer.